Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and I'm very excited today because we have Allison Joubeau, and she's a therapist. She is one of our podcast experts on our team, and she has her own podcast on our um, our on our community team. Um, she is a specialist. Uh, she specializes in many different topics, and today she wanted to talk about something that she feels is really beneficial. Uh, that's going to hit a lot of women and a lot of couples and relationships that she thinks that will help improve relationships. But before we go out and we get into this topic, I'm just going to do a quick shout out to our sponsors today. And they are the um, Health Wellness Expo. And they're going to be doing a, um, a, a event in the Livingston, New Jersey area. They're calling it the Happiness uh, Wellness Expo. And it'll be a lot of different doctors, coaches, and people there giving out products and natural technologies they'll be showing. So check it out. It'll be in our description box. And if you like it, check out the information and visit their website. And they have a phone number where you can contact them if you have any questions. Now, Allison, I am so excited to have you back. I love your podcast. I love the things you're talking on your podcast about. And, you know, today you wanted to tap into talking about relationships and how, you know, it's it's a really uncomfortable subject for a lot of people, the topic of sex. And we all go through so many different problems and issues as a woman. And, you know, sometimes we're afraid to talk about it with our partner. Sometimes we're embarrassed to talk about it. And sometimes we're even, you know, embarrassed to get help because it's just a taboo, you know, topic. And when you look at TV, they make it so glamorous and glorious. And, you know, you compare that, you know, yourself to these these TV shows and like, wow, I'm not experiencing that, you know. And, you know, and sometimes people have, you know, trouble, you know, reaching climax or they have trouble feeling comfortable underneath the sheets with their partner and they love their partner, but they still have sexual issues, you know. So I'm going to leave it to you. I'm going to give you the to uh, and let you talk about this and, you know, uh, tell everybody a little about yourself first, because you know, if they haven't heard your other issue, your other podcast, they'll get to know a little about you. And uh, I love her, her podcast name. It's a note from your therapist. It's like the best name for a website. It, and uh, so tell everybody a little about yourself and then we'll go into this topic because I'm very excited to talk about this. Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, I'm a therapist. I'm a licensed therapist in the state of New Jersey. Um, I just wrote down the happiness wellness uh, convention. That sounds awesome. So I'm going to go check it out myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, I specialize in anxiety and trauma and sex and intimacy. So those are the three sort of buckets that I have very like, you know, specialized expertise in. And what I've found is they kind of all overlap, right? That these aren't these just like independent things where someone might come to me for anxiety or someone might come to me for trauma or someone might come to me because they're having issues, you know? And when I say sex and intimacy, I don't just mean like the physical act of having sex with your partner, right? Yeah. It's like, it, it kind of is an umbrella topic where we can talk about vulnerability. We can talk about body positivity, right? Our self-reflection, yeah. assertiveness skills, sexuality, right? So there's like so much that packs into that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I find that they all kind of flow together, they right? Do. So um, the last few years of my career, I've really been focusing on women, especially high functioning women, right? Like successful women, the ones that are career ladies, or they have this like awesome family or both. Right. right. So you know, the ones that are constantly moving and, um, you know, despite looking so confident from the outside, um, I often find that that type of woman really like struggles with some pretty deep and, you know, sometimes even dark self-talk, right. They're not always kind to themselves and, you know, there's so much messaging about how to, you know, become more confident, become more empowered, really start to like yourself, self-compassion. I think with like social media and things like that, we see this message everywhere, but I don't see it a lot as it relates to, yeah. you know, bedroom stuff, sexy time, right? And so, you know, part of my message has been, you know, as you mentioned, I have a website, uh, a note from your therapist, my social media handle as well. I have my own podcast that's starting in um and at the end of February called Becoming Unstoppable. But this is something that I really want to focus on because I think it just affects so many women. And we, like you said, we don't talk about it, yeah. right? And we talk about comparison bias so often when it comes to anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, you go on that social media and you see people in their matching pajamas, right? At the Christmas picture. 
and you're like, damn it, my family doesn't look like that. And you feel all that like deep sense of like, well, they, everybody has something I don't. And I think that is so true of, you know, sex, intimacy, honestly, even just relationships. Yeah. And I was thinking about this the other day, that exact point, like, what is the archetype that we have for sex, including couples, right? Yeah. And I was watching, I was like binge watching TV last week, right? Like I didn't feel well, I was just like on the couch, spent a whole weekend binge watching TV. Mm-hmm. You know, there wasn't a single storyline of anything that I watched where it was uncomfortable or sticky or you know someone was insecure or they were having problems lining up and like that's the truth you know like that's real life it's just like every other part of a marriage or a partnership it's complicated so yeah that's where I like to start yeah and and I I think it's a topic that people don't like to talk about like sometimes you'll get into a group of girls they'll joke about it a little bit and they'll say things and you're like wow they feel like that too you know yeah and, you know, it's, it's, it's something that like, you know, it could resort back from your childhood years that you've gone through trauma and then it's affected you in your adult years, or, you know, you, you might love your, your partner. They're the perfect partner. You have this great, you know, friendship, you have this great partnership, you know, but underneath the covers, the sparks aren't like fireworks, you know, like, like you see on TV and you're like, you know, or, you know, people don't really understand that men think completely different than women and women think completely different than men and I even would joke around with my husband it's like I've been with him for like 30 plus years now and it's like I'm like he still doesn't get like the the simplest things out of all these years and he still doesn't get it you know it's just you know and you know sometimes it's just I think it's just because we're you know different different sexes that maybe we just don't think alike or, you know, or they just, you know, it's personality trait, maybe, you know, you yeah. have your you know, type one, type two type person and three type person. And, you know, and it, this it could be so many factors, but I, I like the fact that, you you know, you, you mentioned that we don't, you know, we, we really shouldn't, you know, compare ourselves to these TV shows because these TV shows never show the real thing. And Gosh. so many people do that. And even on Facebook, I joke around because you see, I see so many people I know and they put on that perfect picture life. And I know for a fact, they don't have that perfect picture life. I don't even have that perfect picture life. I'll be, I'll be the first one to admit it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so again, what's your, your, your intake, like when it, when it comes to like relationships and stuff, you know, common things that you see in your practice that women go through and, you know, people are afraid to talk about, but there, there are issues that you consistently hear about, and maybe you could add some solutions or tips to them too. Yeah, you know, Absolutely. Um, the first thought I'm having is, you know, when you said like, there's such a difference between men and women. Um, I was reading this article several years ago, but it really stuck with me. And it was saying that they inventoried a bunch of women and a bunch of men. And they said like, you know, how, how do you have sex? What do you want? And what the women said is in order for them to have sex, they needed to feel safe, right? They needed to feel safe, seen, comforted. They just, it need, which makes sense. Right. Yeah. But the men actually said having sex makes them feel safe. Right? So the women already needed safety before they were willing to walk in. They needed to feel like they were pretty, that they could be vulnerable. And the men, that's how they built, you know, the vulnerability. Yeah. And why that is important is it's like there's can already be, you know, if we're talking about just like, you know, the stereotypical um, and particularly, you know, heterosexual couple, it's like that already is a divide, right? Like yeah. my husband's like, I want to connect to you. Let's go. Right. And then she's like, Oh, but I don't feel safe enough to connect. Right. And then we get, you know, all sorts of off, like off alignment. Um, so that is something that comes up, right? So here's some major points that I see in, um, in the sex therapy that I do. And I particular, I work with both men and women, but I don't work with couples anymore. I only work with the individual. Mm -hmm. Um, so one, right. Difference in how much they want to have sex. So, and that can go either way. I think stereotypically we say like men want it all of the time. But there are many, many men that don't and many women, especially, you know, when they hit their sexual peak, women hit their sexual peak actually much later, like, you know, anywhere between like 35 to 55. Right. (laughs) Right. Where men a lot of the times have that earlier. Again, these are all pretty wide stereotypes, but nonetheless, there's research to back it. So one, you know, what happens when two couples want a different amount of sex? Right. Right. Two, you know, body positivity, I think plays in particularly for women, right? It 
sex is the most vulnerable thing I think we do. We literally get naked. We're sharing our space, our air, our body. And if we're not feeling confident, that can be a really triggering experience, right? So, you know, that's something that comes up too. How do I feel comfortable if I really, all I want to do is like turn off the lights and like be under the covers and kind of shrink myself. Right. right? And in that headspace, it's really hard to have fun, right? If we're so self-aware and we're so like just insecure, that's, that's not, you know, an ideal circumstance for like what we're trying to create inside of the bedroom. Yeah. Uh, So that comes up for sure. Um, the other thing that I think is like super taboo, but it, it comes up so often is like people want new things, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you've been with your husband for 30 years. I've been with mine for 13, right? Like, look, I was in my twenties when I met him, Mm -hmm. you know, what I have evolved to want in all things in my life have significantly changed. I eat different food. I listen to different music. I watch different TV, right? So it makes a whole lot of sense that we would then inside of our sex life also maybe want to try something different. Maybe the things we used to love are starting to get old. Yeah. And I think there's just such a big concern of like, there's so much fear around sharing that. Mm -hmm. you know, want to even just say, I want something different, right? That's super vulnerable. We're scared. We're going to get judged. We're going to get rejected and also communication, right? I just was talking to a client um, a few months ago and she was saying, you know, like, I can't tell him I like something. I don't like the thing he used to do anymore. It would hurt his feelings, you know? And it's like, maybe, right. But if we just normalize people want different things and part of connection is Mm -hmm. getting to experiment together, Yeah. right? it actually can turn the narrative differently. But if I think if I share this with my husband, he's going to get so offended. If I share this with my partner, they're going to get so offended. I'm not going to share it, right? Yeah. I think those are some of the, like the main things that come up. I think a lot of times too, it's, it's you know, we don't realize it, but we have to be very careful how we say it. Because I mm-hmm. think I think our, our partners take it sometimes overly sensitive. Like we might be trying to just, you know, want to change things up and they you know, we'll take it as an offense to their either manhood or their, you know, for a woman, her womanhood, you know, and like, she's not good enough. She's not performing well. Or, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you don't like me in the bedroom, you know, then it's a damper where you don't want to do it, you know? And, you know, I, I think I, I hear that a lot, you know, and especially I feel like when your hormones start to change as you get older, I think people become even more sensitive. I'm seeing, you know, And so it's like, how do you deal with, you know, the, when you verbalize it to your partner, is there a specific way that is really helpful to to verbalize it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I don't think it's that different than the other things that we might have to say to our partners, right? It's like a lot of validation. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there's a tactic in psychology called the shared problem. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of means like speaking the elephant in the room before you start the conversation. Right. Hey, partner, I have something that I'm going to share with you. And I want to make sure that I'm setting the intention that this is because like, I'm so jazzed to share this with you. Yeah. I also am worried that you might be offended. So I just want to say like, I'm going to, I'm going to proceed with caution here. I'm going to be nice and gentle. You know, I've been noticed if we're talking about sex, I like, you know what? I've been really interested in trying X, Y, Z. And I was wondering if, you know, you would be willing to share that with me. And it's also, you can even claim like how vulnerable it is. Like, Hey man, Hey lady, I got something to say to you. And it is scary. What is that to come out of my mouth is scary. So also like, let's just handle this with so much care. Yeah. Right. Um, and what I have found is if someone presents it correctly, it's actually exciting. Right. Mm. If you're like, Hey, I want to try this thing. Yeah. Right. Like, it can be spicy. It right. doesn't have to be triggering. And I think just letting then whatever feelings come out, right? If your partner starts to get upset, validate that. I can right. see why you're upset. Change is scary. And just keep going back to the why, right? I yes. always tell the couples, like, go back to the why. Why are you sharing this? Yeah. Well, because, you know, ultimately deep relationships withstand difficult conversations, right? right. They withstand change. Yeah. So this is just part of our life. Like we want to, we want to shake something up a little bit. And I'm doing that because I want to share it with you. I'm excited to share it with you. I think our right. connection will be deeper, right? You know, obviously if you present it like, Hey, I think our bedroom's really stale and I'm getting super bored and I just want to try something else. Like yeah. probably not as well. Right. So just, you know, spice it up, 
be really able to smile, you know, and, and yeah. just let whatever feelings come, come like at the end of in tears, that's okay too. It doesn't have to be positive, but just raw, truthful and validating. Right. I think a lot of times too, like when I would write articles, I would get like a lot of hits when I would talk about what happens when the spark starts to die out, because a lot of people will go through their changes too, and their libido is dropping. Or for men, they they start going through erectile dysfunction and they start noticing that, you know, that uh, they're not performing the way they were before, you know, things are starting to change down below. And, you know, all of a sudden their sex life is starting to decrease and, and they're figuring ways to get that libido up and they're figuring ways to get things back to the way it used to be. And, you know, does it always have to be everything in the bedroom? Can we spark the relationship up beside the bedroom? And, you know, and what are some ways that people, you know, you just mentioned a bunch of ways that, you know, you could work on sparking the relationship up. But, you know, first, what do you do to to when, when you've been together for so long and things are starting to kind of get little, they call it the blah, blah syndrome, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such an important point. And I'm so glad that you mentioned it. You know, first off, huge message that I have for anyone listening. It is okay if your sparks start to dwindle. That is a normal part of so many relationships. It does not mean that you are in imminent danger. It doesn't mean you don't love your partner. And it doesn't mean that those sparks can't come back. Right. right? But there are so many reasons that our sex lives start to dwindle, right? We, you know, I mean, there's a honeymoon phase for a reason, right? Yeah. Usually when we start dating someone, <clears throat> we're more free right? we're like super into them and then as time progresses it's like you might have kids you might have job responsibilities you might have a mortgage all the unsexy things start to come yeah. into you you're arguing over who's doing the dishes who's picking up the kids right yeah. so there's all that emotional stuff and then like you mentioned there's so many physical things as well right it's like listen you know as we age things start to go wrong right yeah. they don't show up the same way that they used to <laughs> yeah. and that's true all things in our body. And that's just part of a normal experience. So, you know, how do you reconnect the, reconnect the sparks? You know, I think first you just acknowledge that it's okay, that they're not the same. That is not meaning that you are failing as a couple and, you know, really look at why is this happening? Right. Right. Is it too tired? Is it because we've lost our connection to each other? Is there something physical going on? Right. Right. If there's something physical going on, I would highly recommend seeing a doctor if that's of interest to you, right? Right. A man who's going through ED, like God bless modern medicine. We have medicine for that. Exactly. Yeah. That is a terrible thing. And even for women, right? They're they can have pain as they get older, Mm -hmm. right? Menopause can certainly screw up our hormones. It sure does. Yeah. Right. Have there's ways to, you know, talk to a doctor, see you know, and you have to want to, it's okay. Also, if you're, you're becoming less sexual, like I want to, I want to normalize that too. That's all right. Yeah. But there are ways to treat those things if that's what you're interested in. And then on a more emotional level, you know, I always say to couples like, okay, well the bedroom suddenly has come off the the table for whatever reason. Right. Suddenly putting the pressure that there's going to be like these epic sparks, right. That's usually too much. And that pressure makes us really like it. It's, it's a cycle that gets us into trouble, right? I put yeah. a lot of pressure on myself to have really hot sex. The more I walk into that room, the more nervous I'm going to be, the less likely to have good sex. Right. So like go the whole way back to the basics. You know, I was just saying to a client the other day, like, okay, when you guys lay in bed together, I just want you to touch toes, right? Mm-hmm. Like just like find, find the foot, right? And just get comfortable touching each other again, right? Yeah. When you sit on the couch, have a cuddle. What mm-hmm. did you like to do? Were you the couple that held hands? Do yeah. that. Like start with the thing that doesn't feel so scary, right? right? Go for the thing that feels comfortable and then build from there because then you're going to build momentum. You're going to build connection. You're going to build safety, right? right? We don't want to send, we don't want to make the goal too far. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I know when I was writing articles, I got a lot of hits when I talked about faking it. Like a lot of women <laughs> would, would be afraid to tell their husbands, well, you know, it was okay, but, you know, and, or, you know, you you know, I really didn't like, you know, when you did this, you know, and, but they, they faked it, you know, and uh, is how dangerous can that be in a relationship? And what do you do when you actually, there are things maybe going on that you, you really don't like, you know, is faking it a really dangerous thing that could really jeopardize the relationship? Because I, I seems like a lot of women do it from, from the responses I got. (laughs) Yeah. What a great question. You know, I, I do think, I mean, what is faking it, right? At the bottom line, it's miscommunication, 
right? Yeah. You're, you're sending a message. I love this. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, right, it's, it, yeah, that could be very dangerous. Um, you know, most women, and I don't remember the stats off the top of my head, so I'm not even going to misquote them, but most women report faking it. And most women report not having an orgasm from penetrative sex. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I go back to all those TV shows, right. It's yeah. To me, right. Women are always like super into it. Right. You, I, I can't even think of a TV show where the woman yeah. was like, you know, actually you try that instead. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't have any sort of baseline for that. It's okay to speak up for your needs, right? right. There is sort of this cultural, I don't know, <laughs> schema that it's yeah. like men have hot sex and we show up to the men, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Women can claim their sexuality, right? Like yeah. women are sexual, like straight up, they are. Yeah. Part of that is trusting your partner. Right. And, and be able to you know, start to communicate that. And you don't necessarily need to use words, right? Like yeah. I can move my partner's hand. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, you know, again, is there going to be some learning curves? Might our partner get offended? You know, you'll have to see partners are different if right. they do, right? Afterwards, like, hey, I just want to try this. But yeah, if we can, if we can collectively as a group all decide, like no more faking it, right? We get to show up and actually have good sex. The yeah. sex that we want, the sex that gets us off authentically. Mm hmm. We'd be in the power positions. You know? Yeah, exactly. Power. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I know. Like when I when I did polls and I and I and I talked about it, so many women never hit climax. They never experienced orgasm. They would have sex. They would have fun. They said, but they never had an orgasm. You know, and I was really surprised by that. Like I, I was like, you never had an orgasm. They're like, no. You know, yeah. and uh, so. It, but it seemed like so common, like so many women right. were saying the same thing over yeah. and over and over again. Yes. You know, and, and that's where, you know, this gets to be extra taboo, but it's like, figure out what you like, right? Yeah. Like you are a person, you can figure out on your own what you like and you don't like the more yeah. that we do something, the more power we have. Right. right. And so, and if, you know, it's only comfortable you sharing with your partner, that's fine too. But just, you know, try to find the things you like yeah right? if you've mm -hmm. never had an orgasm before you've never come to climax that doesn't mean that like all hope is lost right, right? but it does mean giving yourself permission to explore exactly because right? they say you know it's, it's good to get comfortable with yourself and really you know some women you know when they hear it because they grew up in, in a certain generation with certain parents and you know certain environment you know it's not okay to touch yourself it's not okay but then how do you know what you like and how do you know what's parts are sensual and and sensitive to certain certain feelings if you don't explore and it, yeah. you know you should be able to explore with the person you like and, and even if you want to explore by yourself you should be able to there's nothing wrong with that you know and then like when you were talking i thought about also stress plays such a big factor in 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 having an orgasm and even for a man you know reaching his climax and and being able to enjoy yeah. sex and so many people because we live in such a stressful society go 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 especially in the area we come from you know everybody is on the go nonstop everybody's stressed you know you know how do you learn to hang up the coat and then get into it, get into, into, you know, your room or wherever, and just be able to relax. Because I think in order to really have good sex, you have to learn how to let go. Isn't that true? Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. It's so true. Right. So, you know, as part of being an anxiety therapist, something that I speak so highly about is learning mindfulness. Right. And so mindfulness is real for me, the way that I describe it yeah. is really just the idea of getting out of your head right? And being like, right. if you're cooking, you're cooking, right? You're not, yeah. you know, a lot of people will experience this at the, at the gym, right? If you're like going for a run or you're on the elliptical or you're, you know, doing weights, it's, a, it's more difficult to tap into, okay, on Tuesday, I have this appointment. I got to pick up my kids, right? It's like, that's a space where we're typically mindful. Yeah. And in the bedroom is someplace that like mindfulness is just key, right? Being present. Like if you're really trying to connect with someone or multiple people, right? right? Like you really have to note it. Like sex is so subtle, right? Like the yeah. little touches, the little noises. 
Yeah. And if you are out in, you know, thinking about 400 other things, you're missing so much of the point, yeah. right? So, Mm -hmm. and and the experience, and that's a lot of the times, you know, it would be then hard to climax, right? If I'm just like thinking about the things I have to do later. Yeah. So, you know, again, just kind of like the touching of the toes, right? Mm -hmm. Getting to that space where you're really present in sex might be multiple steps down the line. Right. I always say to clients, like, start doing with something that's really easy, right? When you practice just focusing on cutting the onions, right? Smelling the food the sound of it sizzling, like just practice on like a lower stakes yeah. events, right? You yeah. know, when you're at the gym, really practice, like my foot is hitting the pavement, my foot is hitting the pavement, my foot is hitting the pavement, yeah. right? Because training your brain to understand how to have an experience like that, right? Right, And then it'll be a little easier. And so, you know, if you're in the bedroom and you're starting and, and it's, you know, the whole experience is too much at the beginning, yeah. focus on just kissing, right? Mm-hmm. There's something that we do in sex therapy where you'll, you know, over the course of a few days, it'll be like, okay, day one, we are there. You are not allowed to orgasm, right? Like no orgasm is off the table. Mm-hmm. The The goal is just to touch a part of each other's bodies and you take turns that is mm-hmm. not sexual, right? So, Hey, I'm going to just caress your elbow, right? right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stroke your hair. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give your neck a massage. Right. And it's the idea that we're getting comfortable touching each other. Right. Like that's, that's the end of the story. And then the next day you move up to something sexual, right. Something that we, and then third is like genitals. And then fourth is like, okay, now we can actually have intercourse and, you know, sky's the limit, go crazy. Right. Right. But I don't think we learn, you know, something I say so often on these podcasts and with clients, it's like sex is a skill, right. And no one is born knowing how to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, not at least not having good sex. I think we could probably immediately just figure out what goes in what. Yeah. But you know, the, like good, tender, intimate sex. Yeah. It takes a lot of practice. It right? does. Mm-hmm. It does. And then, then like you think you figure it out, and then you get a new partner. Yeah. And it's like, you know, damn it, the thing that worked with that one doesn't work with this one, and they got to start exactly. all over. Again, mm-hmm. Right. So it's just you know trying exploration right? Figuring out what you like, figuring out what you don't like. Yeah. stuff. And I think like when you were saying that, I was also thinking, you know, as we get older too, different things, just like, you know, like every seven years we change and then we might like sweets when we were younger, we don't like sweets now. And then sometimes I think our partners, they go back, you know, I see this so many times, even in discussions, like at, at you know, when you go out to dinner and people start to, you know, if they're close friends, they'll talk about sex sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they go back to their 20s, especially men, like men, like love to go back into their younger days and compare. And I'm like, you know, but, you know, what worked then doesn't really work now. You know, no. it's like, you know, things change, people change. So then you have to just like you said, you know, when you, it's kind of like having a new partner, even if you're with the partner partner for so long, because right. you change as a person. So the things you used to like, you may not like, you know, or you may not like as much. You may like something different. So that uh, communication, I think, always has to be there. And that exploration has to be there. But like, I think communication is key. And I think so many people surprisingly lack that communication. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I think communication, when they do polls on like, who goes to couples counseling and why, wh- what is bringing them? What's their presenting problem? Communication is listed always as number one, right? Most people who are seeking couples counseling will say we're having communication problems. Mm-hmm. So if we're having communication problems around like co-parenting, finances, right? How much vacation time we want to take? Like those are, we can see the communication problems in like the more mundane relationship stuff. Like yeah. imagine how difficult it is then to communicate about sex where most of us have built no skills around, right? Again, you might come from parents who are really strict or you might've come from purity culture or you might've come from just like no one in your life ever talked about sex before. And suddenly you're supposed to know how to talk about it with your partner. Yeah, right? that's so hard. So many communication issues just in relationships, period. But definitely, definitely, definitely when we're talking about sex and, you know, rewinding back to what we were talking about earlier, that's where it's just like, you kind of have to lean into the trust of your partner. Yeah. I like I'm in, I, I want to have a good relationship, right? Ultimately it serves both of you, right? Mm-hmm. If you figure out how to talk about sex, you have better sex. Everybody wins. Yeah. So it's like, look, I can trust 
that I can have vulnerable conversations with my husband or my wife or my partner, yeah. right? It may be uncomfortable because it's unfamiliar. That is okay, right? Oh. But this is really important. And it my relationship can withstand important conversations, Yeah, right? We'll, we'll fumble and fall as we figure this out, even how to talk about it, but that's okay, right? Because I'm just learning a skill. Right. I feel like a lot of times too, like when I would talk to a lot of women, they would say that, you know, they may not be in the mood or they may be satisfied and they don't need it as much as men do. And when they didn't feel like having intercourse, the husbands or the partners or the boyfriends would stomp away like they had, you know, like you took away their ice cream and stuff <laughs> like that, you know, and it's like, you know, how do you deal with that? Like, you know, because they, you know, because women, I, you know, first of all, the one thing I hear about women, you know, I hear it from so many different people is it takes them longer get, to get to that point where they could actually feel comfortable, safe, or getting ready to climax or get into the point where they feel, you know, they're starting to feel different emotions. It takes them longer. And then you have men who need it all the time or want it all the time, even if they can't get it up. You know, I hear this all the time. Yeah. Women will joke around and, you know, the husband will be like, oh, blah, 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 blah. and then the woman's like, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's like that, that, you know, it's, it's like that communication, like you said it, but it's like, you know, women react so differently because we're, we're two different species. And, you know, so if you have one that, that it takes longer and then you have a, a husband who may be either impatient or doesn't understand what a woman's going through, you know, how do you make a man see through a woman's eyes? Because <laughs> so, so many times I, I hear it over and over and over again, I'll hear it from women who have been with the same man for so long you know, and they just don't get it, you know, yeah. and it's so funny. I mean, I wish I had the answer of how <laughs> we get a man to see through a woman's eyes. I feel like if I had that answer, I'd like break the internet uh, <laughs> <laughs> on a, you know, on like, where do we begin note? You know, one, I think the idea, like there is so much, and if you think of the most stereotypical sex scene, right? Like just envision a sex scene in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That you've ever seen before it's like the guy orgasms right like that's the end right that's where the curtain is called it's yeah. like we don't really ever think that the idea that we're gonna have sex and the, the man doesn't climax is right right yeah and the truth is it really shouldn't look like that right, right. so it's like there should be some times where it's like the man doesn't right and right. maybe the girl does or nobody does right right and you know i think just like you were saying, right? Like women typically fake orgasms because they don't know how to just have the experience to not, right? Yeah. Like they're not going to harm their partner. You know, I used to work primarily with men before I switched to women. And, you know, for them, it would feel, it's not only just like, but yay, that feels good. I want to do that. It's also a disappointment, right? Like a man often can feel like, oh yeah, if I didn't do this, like I failed, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so taking that pressure away. Right. And so this is where I think sex therapy with couples really works awesome. Um, you know, because so we need to reprogram our thoughts, yeah. right? We have so many ideas of what sex is supposed to look like and almost none of our sex actually does look like that. Yeah. So reprogram the thought. It's like, Hey, the woman is allowed to orgasm without the man. The man is allowed to not orgasm sometimes because it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. we can just start and not finish. Right. Right. The goal sex is to build connection it's to build intimacy it's to have a nice time it isn't the end goal like it's not always pornography kind of ending right it's yeah. just like this is okay that like we've just timed out right, right. because it's not feeling good anymore or because I'm tired because the kid is crying in the other room like lots yeah. of reasons right so I think if we just change our programming around what sex is supposed to look like you know those egos will start to come down those insecurities will start to come down yeah uh, if you have the type of partner where you can have an easy conversation, right? Great, right? If you have the type of partner that's storming into the other room, that's always where I say get some extra help, right? Because sometimes yeah. it's easier to hear from someone else than it is from you, right? If a therapist is saying it, it might be less triggering. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of taboos around men in therapy and even more so stigma around men in sex therapy. Yeah. I always 
people, you don't have to tell anyone, right? Right, exactly. You and your partner being in therapy is a private matter. If you want to scream it from the rafters, Godspeed. If that's something that's just private to you, that's okay. But like every, every couple needs help, right? Yes. They just do. So find help somewhere if you guys are struggling communicating towards each other. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I feel like when I, when I wrote articles on erectile dysfunction, I, the one article I wrote got over 70,000 hits. It was like, because, you know, you don't hear about it very often. And when you hear about it, it's written by a doctor. So you're hitting, you're hearing the, about the treatment, the causes, you know, and, yeah. and all the basics, but there are so many people out there that are going through all these emotions because you know, the fear of failure or yeah. you know, not, not satisfying their partner or, you know, is this the re way the rest of my life is going to be like, you know, and, you know, all these, these fear factors, especially for a man, because for yeah. a man, you know, they take it very, you know, it's, it's like their macho manlyhood, you know, it's like, you're like, it's like, if you don't have that, forget about it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, so when you have, you know, for all these people that are suffering from erectile dysfunction, you know, what do you suggest to them? Because, you know, I, it was amazing when I wrote those articles, how many people tuned in to read those articles, because there's so many people out there yeah. experiencing it. So when people are starting to go through erectile dysfunction, and I, I've talked to people that had gone through it all the way from 39 and up, you know, like yeah. it doesn't have to happen later in life. People, oh. people can experience it at any age. Absolutely. So what do you do all of a sudden when you can't, you know, you're not getting enough of blood flow to that part of the body and you're not getting an erection and all of a sudden they're panicking. I mean, yeah, you know, so why people can get ED, you know, certainly I think the most common thing is just like age, right? That's what we think of, but yeah. you're right. It's like, it can be stress, right? There can be just, just that alone. Yeah. Right? And so for sure, I think a man who's suffering from ED is like, yeah, his ego is probably going to get hurt. Right. Because like yeah. that is so in our culture, like, man, do this. Yeah. But for, and it can be really emotional too. Right. Like yes. a woman whose husband is having trouble getting it up. Like what might her first thought be? Right? right. I would imagine it's not uncommon for someone to be like, well, I'm not beautiful anymore. I'm not attractive. He doesn't want me. Right. right? So there's so much emotion packed around sexual dysfunction. Yeah. Right? right. We really, we, you just hit the Google, you're going to see all the medical stuff, but we don't really talk about the emotional impact yeah. that that type of thing happens. Right. And because there's so much shame around it, no one is normalizing that it is actually yeah. pretty common inside of, you know, I mean, again, like someone can just be drinking too much, right? Like there's exactly. so many. Things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, how does a couple deal with that? You know, I'm, I'm going to give the most therapist to answer here, but it's like, you talk about it, right? Yeah. And and not like talk about it from an emotional point, right? So, you know, I am feeling unattractive. I am feeling like I can't show up and provide for you, even though this is just related to sex, but now I'm feeling like my masculinity is questioned. Right. Are these tough conversations? Absolutely. Right. Are they comfortable? Absolutely not. Do we do we think about having them? Also, no, we usually get scared, right? And this is why yeah. I go back to like find some support, read some articles, check out your article, right? Like, <laughs> information that can help validate and give you some tools. Um, but you got to talk about it, right? Yeah. If it's affecting your relationship, you just have to. And, you know, I know it's taboo and I know it's uncomfortable, but it does not get better right. unless you talk about things on an emotional level. This is your partner, right? Yeah, it's the person exactly. that you're sharing the most amount of vulnerability with, right? So you got to talk about that stuff too. And it's funny, it's, it's such a taboo topic, you know, it's, it's part of everybody's life, but okay. yet nobody wants to talk about it, you know, oh. because, you know, it was the old generation that kept it quiet and, but, you know, we're, we're going into new generation and, and new That's way of thought and it's still, a little, you know, you don't really hear it very much, you know, you'll hear it once in a while, people will bring it up and, but you very, very, you know, it's not very often, but it's something that really needs to be talked about because there's so many issues that people go through when it comes to, you know, finding out, finding, you know, um, either their sexuality, what makes them, you know, excitable, what works for them, you know, how they're feeling with the person they love, you know, yeah. and, uh, and then another question I, I got a lot of times was, what do you do? I think we, we, we just talked about this not too long ago, when you love the person or the person is the perfect partner, but the sex sucks, you know, yeah. and that was, a, that was another question I got 
over and over and over again. It's like, you know, everything else is great, but you know. Yeah. yeah you know, two thoughts I'm having. One is just on like how taboo sex is in general. Like as, as you were talking, I was just thinking that, you know, like, so I'm a sex therapist and I have a, a good social media following Yeah, and I can't actually write the word sex, right? <laughs> Instagram makes you like, you know, you know, get it. I have to put like a dollar sign or a little. Oh, star. really? Yeah. Because they'll flag you if you write the word sex. And it's like that already. I mean, and I can appreciate that there's probably some parameters there because they don't want misinformation being spread. Yeah. But it's like, what does that tell you? It, it looks like a dirty word, right? Like yeah. we're really, you know, it's the same as any kind of a curse word. Yeah. Right? So, you know, that that's a big deal. You know, right. it just absolutely is. Um, and then to the point of like, oh my God, my partner is these knees, but the sex sucks. Yeah. You know, again, I want to normalize the hell out of that. That right. is so very common. And, you know, now in this like new generation, there's so many people that are um, like in what, I don't even know what they are, less than millennials um, who are having open relationships, poly relationships. And, you know, not to say that that's your lifestyle that you want to be picking, but I think it does at least highlight the idea mm -hmm. that it is very difficult for one person to meet all of our needs. Yeah. Okay, so if you're in a monogamous lifestyle, I want to at least just say it's okay that this person may meet your emotional need, your financial need. You're the greatest co-parents in the whole wide world, but yeah. very few partners check every box. Right. Again, the beautiful part is these are things you can build. Right. right? person is not good in bed that doesn't mean it is hopeless it, there is learning that can happen there is communication that can happen you can absolutely improve that just like you can in anything else right, right. like you know I'm not a good cook I'm much better than I was five years ago right <laughs> lots of trial and error yeah. so don't hope if you know it's there's no sparks in your bedroom and your person's meeting every check mark right, right? that's just where you need to talk and need to be open and honest about that right we have one person that's in our community, but she talks about, she talks about, um, porno addiction and, mm -hmm. you know, some people use porno as a way of foreplay to get them excited in bed beforehand. And then, you know, as she was saying, some people go overboard and to the point where they're ignoring their partner and, you know, and it's not real. So, yeah. you know, it's fantasy. So, yeah you know, where, you know, is it healthy? And if it is, you know, where do you draw the line? Because, you know, it seems like some people take it to the extreme where it could actually hurt the relationship yeah. if it's not used properly. Yeah. You know, the thing about porn is exactly what you just said, right? It's curated. It is not an accurate depiction of what almost anyone's sex life looks like. Right. right? There is a director, there is lights, they are positioned, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think just like ingesting any type of social media or just media in general, it's like, first of all, we have to totally flag that as important, right? Yeah. Because there's so many, you know, and I think this actually affects women even more maybe than men, but like women think they're supposed to behave like that, right? Yeah. And it's, that's not natural. It's it's not natural, period, right? Exactly. So, you know, you can use porn as a tool, you know, where is it healthy, it's mm -hmm. like, well, sometimes we watch it to, you know, figure out what we're interested in, right? right. And again, I want like ethical consensual porn, obviously. Um, and then two, yeah, absolutely as like foreplay, right? This is the way for us to, you know, get turned on, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Where does it go wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say the same thing that I say about all things that are sort of like anxiety versus intuition, like drop into your body. Is it feel compulsive? Or does it feel good? Right. right. If you're ignoring your partner and he or she is getting upset. Yeah. Right. That is creating a partner, I mean, a problem. Right. right. So, you know, if, I mean, certainly if we're talking about the extreme, like porn addiction, you know, usually that's any kind of an addiction falls under, like I'm, I'm neglecting other responsibilities. I'm not going to work. I'm neglecting my partner. Right. Like I'm doing things that don't align to my core values. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it's a, it's a tough balance of where is the appropriate line of this stuff, but I don't yeah. think it's that much different than anything else you're using, right? Like right. how much you eat junk food or how much you drink wine or, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we do yeah. sort of have measures of things that we like, but we have to be careful about getting to the extreme. Exactly. So you know, how do you listen to that intuition? And now it's like, you have your tools, you have your little check engine light, you know, right. mm -hmm. be honest with yourself. Exactly. Right? It's supposed to be a tool. It's not supposed to replace real sex. 
Exactly. Exactly. hundred percent. Now, if you had to take some takeaways from everything that we talked about today, what are some things you'd like to emphasize about today? Uh, I would like to emphasize that it is okay if you are having any kinds of problems in the bedroom, right? Right. You're struggling from ED, if there is concerns about your body, if you are finding it uncomfortable, if you are noticing you're insecure about, you know, stating what you like or what you don't like, that is normal. That is okay. We don't talk a lot about this. So yeah. it's for most of us. So I think that for me is the biggest takeaway I want people to hear because my goal for that is to reduce anxiety, right? Is right. to not feel so alone, right. right? When we're going through this stuff, a lot of the times it's like, you know, hell, I'm the only person on earth who experiences this. And that's just yeah. simply not true. So if we can pull away that stigma and that shame, I think we'll all do a little better at communicating, you know, yes. 100%. that would be my biggest takeaway. A hundred percent. Yeah. Now, what kind of services do you provide on your website? So people can, when they go to, to your yeah. website, they know all the different yeah. things you provide. Oh my gosh. I'm, 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 I'm doing it all these days. So I provide therapy and I provide private coaching for people outside of New Jersey. Uh, again, I specialize in anxiety, trauma, and sex and intimacy. And I particularly work with high functioning women who are working on their self-esteem. Um, I have a new podcast dropping on we're, we're shooting for the 14th of February it might be closer to the end of the month <laughs> called becoming unstoppable <laughs> similar topics as you re really trying to get some messaging out to women um, and I have a free newsletter where I just drop you know mental health tips I'm trying to make my message a little more accessible since not everybody has access to you know mental health it's not treatment per se but it does you know offer some basic skills uh, right that also can be found on my website so yeah that's what I'm doing and tell everybody your website name before we go. <laughs> it is a note from your therapist and social media <laughs> handles the same. So that's awesome. This has been great. I think this is so important because it is such a taboo topic. I think so. I think I think I guarantee you, you know, we say not to use the word all, but I guarantee you almost everybody has had problems with intimacy or sex, you know, anything, you know, that ha is, is in the realm of, of sexuality problems. You know, there are people, everybody's had some type of, of problem and, you know, some of it could be just from communication. Some of it could be from age. So it, there's so many things out there, so many reasons and causes, but the thing is, is that people shouldn't be shy away and they shouldn't, they shouldn't, you know, feel like it's, it's something they can't talk about. So I'm glad they have people like you who, you know, deal with this, because if you don't feel like talking to your friend or you're embarrassed, you know, you really want an unbiased opinion an educated opinion, they could go to somebody like you and get that unbiased opinion and get that direction so they could start improving themselves. Because I think some also too, if even if it's a couple thing, if, if one person improves, they could take their knowledge, you know, and they, and they could kind of like, kind of the energy kind of goes to the other person and just by one person getting better it will I think spark interest for the other person to want to improve themselves as well to please that person if the love is there you know absolutely yeah absolutely well, this has been great. I am so glad that you are on our, our podcast team. And I'm so glad that, you know, you come consistently to do podcasts and <laughs> Allison will be back shortly, you know, with a new podcast and to talk about. <laughs> and this has been amazing. Thank you so Goodbye. much for coming on the show today. I am so happy that you came on. Same. Thank you so much. You have a great day. You too.